All right, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, Ben, for leading us in some great worship today. Uh, that truly is a great uh, just setup for what this day is all about, and that is leading us into praise, into conversation with our God. And uh, I just want to take a second here uh, and welcome you, especially if you're new. And thank you guys for coming. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be in community. And that's really what we're going to be talking a lot about. And we're going to be celebrating uh, this sacred act of communion as well. And uh, talk more about that in a little bit. So uh, one thing we do here is we have our Converge Kids Huddle that goes out right now. So if you're one of the big kids, you can head out there and have fun doing that. And... uh, after that, we're going to jump into uh, this talk this week, Converge with Conversations, the final one of this series. And actually, uh, this series, we've had this first one, Who is My Neighbor? And we've been looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan, answering that question, who are we ultimately responsible for helping? What, what are the limits, if any, of our responsibility? And as we talked about, well, there are none. God calls us to love and neighbor everybody, not just those like us or just those who agree with us. Uh, We're going to hit back on those themes again. And then the next week, Conversion with Courage, moving past those barriers uh, that often hinder us from being neighborly. And then last week, you heard from Chad, uh, just converging with compassion and care, specifically uh, that, that parable, that story that Jesus shared in the Good Samaritan and how he acted out of compassion. And what's interesting, he hit it right on the head, Chad did. He said, Compa- or care comes out of compassion. And that's what we see in the parable is he had compassion, and then he acted out in care. And today, uh, we're going to look at a, a person, a professor, a pastor, a psychologist. Her name's Carrie Doring. A couple things from her. But I want to share something out of this book that, uh, that really resonates with what Chad shared so well last week. And she says this about compassion as a, as a key element for pastoral care. She says, the process of care begins when caregivers enter into the care seeker's story-making with a sense of wonder, awe, and humility, opening some, themselves up to the mystery of life narratives. Narratives like religious symbols communicate mystery by pointing beyond themselves to ineffable dimensions of human life that cannot be fully apprehended or articulated. Compassion plays a vital role in the process of pastoral care. Care seekers often bring narratives of pain. Entering into the mystery of another's pain requires compassion. In a literal sense, compassion as cum passio, that's the Latin, caregivers suffer with care seekers. This is that empathy, that Chad was sharing about last week. And why I'm coming back to this is because he talked about how care moves, to, uh, compassion moves to care. And we're going to take one more step in that process today and show how actually from care we move into uh, how to have that care, and that is conversation. And so we can actually ascertain uh, how to care or actually care by just having conversation with them. And so this quote kind of alludes to that, how we enter into their story, enter into their story, enter into their narrative, and how it communicates that compassion and care. But we're going to look at some other stuff from her in a second. But what I wanted to do is set this up this way, so you see where we're going, and then revisit the parable of the Good Samaritan story. Now, this is our fourth week in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I hope you're not thinking, oh, Mitch, just move on already. We've been in this for four weeks. And actually, what I'm hoping you're seeing is how much depth are in just 12 verses. And it's not just true of this passage. This is true of so many other passages throughout the Bible that we can spend four weeks on 12 verses and pull different things out of it each week that really help us, in this case, to be neighborly. And so I'm going to read that for more or less sake of review. So we hear it one last time. This is our final week. And uh, obviously, I'm going to tie in how this uh, compassion and care moves into conversation later. So let's go ahead and read that. It says, Now an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you understand it? 
The expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the expert, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the injured man, he passed He passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came up to that place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling came to where the injured man was, and when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. He went up to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him into an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever else you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the robbers? This is Jesus asking this question. The expert in religious law said, the one who showed mercy to him. So Jesus said to him, go and do the same. And I love this. We've talked all about the story. It's such a revolutionary story, so much to the point that not just church people know this story. Many, many people just in our world, in our, in, in our culture know this story because it's so powerful. And what I love about this is we've talked about how Jesus points to compassion and care as kind of this benchmark of being neighborly and not just to the people like you, the Levite and the, and the uh, priest, but as we talked about in week one, actually challenging those boundaries, that person who may be unclean or uh, is inconvenient in your timing, or even the Samaritan, the way he turns that question, which would be a bitter rival to this guy he's talking to. But what I love about this and what's interesting is that Jesus is using the power of story and narrative to actually provide pastoral care to this legal expert. You don't realize it, but he's actually, it says he's trying to test him, and I believe that's true. He's probably got some opinions about Jesus, but Jesus sets this up perfectly, asking him questions. We're going to dig into this, and we find out that his big concern is about his spiritual mortality. He's not sure, do I have eternal life or not? And he answers the question. Jesus says, yep, you got it. But then he's, he gets to the heart of the question, but who's my neighbor? He is really concerned for his spiritual well-being. He really wants to make sure, am I going to heaven or am I not going to heaven? And he was legitimately stressing over this. And Jesus uses the power of story here to actually uh, minister to him, to care for his soul. So what's cool about this is that, like we said, uh, Jesus was suggesting to him something different than he'd been here. And remember, he'd been taught that basically you just take care of your own people and you're good. You don't have to do anything else. And Jesus has been challenging that view. And then uh, he knew this guy was upset with him and trying to trap him. But ultimately, Jesus knew that the way to influence this guy's soul was not with aggression or shame. He just starts asking him questions. And that's the, the interesting thing about this. He could have went in there and just taken shots and said, nope, this, 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 this. But he he answers a, asks a question that he probably knows the answer to, and by him answering correctly, Jesus is able to say, yeah, that's right. He's affirming him in his, in, in his knowledge and, and what's going on, and what that does, it instantly builds trust in that relationship. And then what happens? Jesus has this interaction with him, then he digs a little bit further, but who's my neighbor? That trust caused him to ask the next question, which was actually more important to him, is actually who, is, who am I responsible for caring for in this, at this time? And uh, when he gets done with this, Jesus doesn't say, go do X, Y, and Z again. He just asks another question. Who is the one who is being a neighbor? Again, asking questions. This guy answers, comes to his own meaning, his own understanding in this thing, and basically answers Jesus' question. All Jesus has to say is, you should go do that. 
And this is just amazing and profound how he moves him through this. And why I mentioned this psychologist, this pastor, she says in this book about pastoral care, and it's a longer quote, some chunks, but I want you to see how important this power of conversation is. This is a psychologist writing prescriptive methodology on how to care for people's souls, and this is what she says. She says, stories allow people to lament with each other, express anger, and question all they know about life without imposing meanings prematurely. In the process of telling stories, people become authors, instinctively finding a story's beginning and climax and imagining various endings. When pastoral care is experienced as a narrative, it becomes more relational and communal. A narrative approach is first and foremost about trust. The more people trust pastoral caregivers, the more they will entrust them with the bits and pieces of their stories, especially the undigested emotional reiterations of trauma. They will invite us into the chaos. She goes on to say, a narrative approach is second, that was the first, most important part, is about finding meanings and practices formed in the crucible of stress, suffering, and joy. Sometimes well-meaning pastoral caregivers move prematurely to making sense of a care seeker story by deductively applying theological themes that are important to them, not the person seeking care. Third, and this is the third and last, And this is important. She says, a narrative approach is about assessment, comparing theological meanings that emerge from care conversations with historical, biblical, sacred, textual, and global theologies referenced prematurely or deductively, like she mentions in the previous paragraph, historical and contemporary theologies will close down emotional and spiritual struggles at the boundaries of known and unknown. Such struggles often decenter care seekers because they're suffering calls into question ultimate beliefs and sacred values. A compassionate and respectful care relationship can provide a trustworthy space for exploring new meanings. I know that's a mouthful there. This is a professor, so you're getting some of that. But I hope you can see what's happening here. She's saying the beauty of using story and narrative, not only entering into a conversation with your story narrative, but like Jesus, he pulls a neutral scenario here, a parable, and allows this guy to go into that story without this accusing tone on his shoulders. It's just some Levite, some priest that make a bad move, and he gets to start deducing meaning on his own. And like she says, it allows him to go into that story, to find its climax, to think about alternate endings, to imagine what could be and what meanings are there without Jesus imposing it on him necessarily, even though Jesus could have easily gave him a straightforward uh, truth comment. He didn't do that. And then what I like about this too is she warns about preemptively imposing theological positions on people. What this means, this is if Maybe you've had this experience. I hope you haven't, but I'm, unfortunately, I'm sure it's happened, whether it's been in a, uh, especially a spiritual realm or even other, other realms. But the spiritual realm looks like this. You go and you talk to somebody who you respect spiritually in their faith, and you say something like, yeah, this thing keeps happening. I don't know how to stop doing this. I don't know how to get out of this pattern of addiction. And the person may say, and maybe they're a recovering addict or whatever. They might just say, you need to pray about it more. Well, I'm never going to dissuade prayer, but that's not actually, that's a little early. You don't even know what's going on here. And these are the kind of warnings, uh, these are the kinds of uh, just kind of deductive premises giving too early can actually derail you and it puts you into a faith crisis moment on the edge of known and unknown is what she's saying. Instead, move like Jesus, start asking questions, start trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, allow them to search through some of this story and narrative, even if it's your life or others' lives or whatever, and allow them to explore meaning on their own. This is what she's getting at. It's really powerful. And I love how this description of pastoral care she gives so clearly articulates the model, exactly what Jesus did in this case. 
And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't, this is a kind of a pretentious attack here. I believe he is genuinely concerned for his spiritual well-being, but it says in here he was trying to test them. There was something going on here. Jesus could have easily just said, you know what, uh, this guy's a jerk. I'm out, <laughs> right? He could have said, you know what, this guy has a bad attitude. I'm not going to entertain him with this. I'm going to just walk away. But he doesn't. He goes to this person who's opposing him publicly at that and walks into this conversation. He converges into the conversation and moves so effortlessly through it too, in a way that's non threatening, in a way that allows him to find meaning in here and ultimately gets him to that question of who is my neighbor. And he was struggling with his own sense of re spiritual reality here. He was wondering, wait, Jesus is talking about something differently than I was grown up, growing up with. And he was unsure about that. And Jesus walks him through in such a way that he was able to explore meaning in this with the, within his own religious paradigm of saying, oh, okay, I, I'm starting to understand what's going on here. I'm starting to see it's not just the people who look like me and think like me that I need to help, but it's everybody. It's everybody, and he does that. He gets through that process. Ultimately, Jesus used conversation to provide care, meaning, and direction to this antagonistic person in his life. And why I'm getting and pulling this out, why I've used this Carrie Doring stuff, is because I want you to see that what Jesus did, uh, he did without taking a psychology class or a psychology textbook. This is not just intuitive to Jesus because he's a smart, clever leader. This is intuitive to Jesus because he created humanity and he understands what makes us tick. And he understands how we need to move this, uh, how we need to move somebody into the direction of spiritual care and into salvation. And I just think it's incredible. And I share that not to just toot Jesus's horn, although I think it should be. I share that because I want anybody in here is really wondering, what is this Jesus guy all about? Is he just this clever guy or what? This is somebody who is living out an example that literally people are writing prescriptive methodology and psychology exactly the way he did it today. To me, that's incredible. This guy's a, a wizard, really. I mean, he's not really. He's a god, but he's, he's awesome, and I want you to see that. I want to bring that to light here. This is really important. Okay, I'm going to show you another example. This is kind of an example of Jesus who is in a caregiving situation. Jesus who's on a being kind of on a, uh, uh, being attacked or at least confronted by an individual. I want to give you an instance that looks a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's more of a corporate imposition of influence, if you will. It's kind of a systemic influence on people. And what do you do more from the vantage point of a care seeker? If you're needing care, what do you do? And so where we get this is in the Apostle Paul. This was a leader in the early church. He had this radical conversion. He was killing Christians, has this radical conversion, and now all of a sudden he's starting churches left and right in Asia Minor and Europe. Literally starting churches everywhere. And uh, he's in prison in Rome now, and he's writing this letter to the church in Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. And now I've been there. It's just a big hill. That's all it is now. It's all under, underground to these days. They haven't really excavated it much. Uh, but he's writing to it. It's primarily uh, Gentile, meaning non-Jewish backgrounds, and primarily, obviously, Roman influence there. And what's happening is his good buddy, Paul's Epaphras, is another pastor. Epaphras actually planted this church. He met Paul in Ephesus, which is about a couple hundred miles away through the mountains. He planted this church in Colossae. Now Epaphras is in prison for the gospel. They're in prison together in Rome. Epaphras is getting reports from Colossae. Epaphras is telling Paul, and he's like, he's never even been there before. He's like, man, I feel so bad for these people. Like, they're being oppressed, not just Roman persecution in general. That's kind of the influence that Paul is getting in Epaphras in prison. But there's this group, they call them the Judaizers, people who are trying to impose kind of uh, going to back to the old ways and Jewish restrictions back on these Christians and basically saying, if you don't do this, you're, you don't have salvation. And so they're feeling more this corporate uh, oppression or influence over them, this whole church in Colossae. 
And Paul writes this letter, which is really an encouragement to them, and a manifesto on God's grace. And basically saying, you don't have to do all these things. God just wants you to experience the grace that comes from believing in his son, Jesus, who came and died for your sins. You don't have to do all those other things. And in the end of this letter, he writes this. He says uh, in, in uh, Colossians 4, 2 through 6, he says, Be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us too, that God may open a door for the message so that we may proclaim the mystery for Christ, for which I am chains. Pray that I make it known as I should. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsider, make, making the most of the opportunities. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer everyone. In the midst of, again, the systemic pressure, not just from the Romans, but the Judaizers, Paul's saying, this is how you need to act. This is how you need to conduct yourselves. Because here's the thing is, it's not easy to do. And he's, this is an encouragement letter. And he says, first, you need to conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders. He's not saying avoid all outsiders. He's not saying put up walls and block outsiders from influencing you. He's saying conduct yourselves with wisdom towards them. He's encouraging them to engage in with those conversations with them. He's saying, hey, I get it. You're not quite sure how to handle some of these situations. Use your best judgment to gauge their intentions. Well, how do you gauge intentions? You talk to them. How in the world do you know somebody's intentions without talking to him? He's pushing them into conversation with the very people that are opposing them and trying to oppress them to some extent. And then he says, you also have to make the most of the opportunities. He's saying, hey, look at it. It may not be the thing you hope for or imagined in your life, but this is an opportunity. Make the most of it. Paul's actually sharing about, he's saying, first, pray for me. Pray for Pavis. We're in prison. Pray that the door to the gospel will be opened. He's not saying pray to get me out necessarily. He's just praying for opportunities for that gospel to be open. In the same way, he's saying, I get it, it stinks, but make the most of the opportunities. There might be something, there might be somebody that actually is looking for a conversation that could change their lives if you're just aware and open to what God's doing in that moment. And then lastly, he says, speak with grace and salt. And what does he move that? I think you have a good sense of when you say, speak with grace, speak with love, speak with compassion. Imagine yourself in a terrible position and speak to them with that same kind of uh, sensitivity, knowing you've been there too. But what does he mean when he says, go with grace and salt? And salt, and maybe you guys have heard this, salt was a very important spice season in this culture. It not only brought really good taste to things, but it also was a preservation seasoning. And he's saying, use, use this uh, tone, this candor to your voice, to your words, that people actually taste something. There's something there that's uh, uh, just gratifying. There's something there that you want. There's something there that's memorable. And I wonder even if that salt and that preservation piece, if he's saying, make sure that when you speak, make sure it's something that they're going to remember. Make sure it's something that's going to last. Not shallow, empty words. He didn't say vinegar. Vinegar is really common at that time. Have you? Do you got some? Of you guys like vinegar? I like vinegar actually, uh, but it is quite pungent, and for most people, it's quite off-putting. And I just think it's interesting. He didn't say vinegar there. You know, he could have. He's trying to say salt doesn't mean bitter. Salt means memorable, and and desirable. So that. Uh, So I want you to understand that. But Paul's saying, converge with conversation even when it's difficult, even when you don't want to, and quite frankly, even when it's easier to just give in to those pressures or isolate yourself from those pressures. And he's ultimately wanting you to be about uh, uh, intentional with the conversations and pushing them to be thankful for what they have and and going to have these conversations. He's telling them, converge with conversation for the sake of God in the people. And I've talked about this. Paul is trying to set the example of, I get life isn't perfect, but you have opportunities to proclaim the goodness of Jesus to these people. So take advantage of it. Go for it. I'm trying to do it as well, Paul's basically saying. I want you to do it. Lean into these conversations. 
Because ultimately, he knows that it's way too easy to cede to these outside pressures and just give in or to run from them or isolate yourselves from them. And he's saying you have to go engage these people. You have to have the right conversations with these people. What does this mean for us? Again, we have two scenarios here in these passages. We have an individual coming to Jesus who's pretty antagonistic towards him and his views. So we probably have people like that in our lives that are just an individual that you feel is antagonistic towards you and you're not sure why. It could be about religion. It could be about life philosophy. It could be about parenting. It could be about work. I mean, you just don't know. There's a million things people can be mad at us for. And there's plenty of things to get mad at each other for right now, unfortunately. The other one is, again, the systemic or corporate pressure uh, of like a, a bigger group trying to change your opinions or change your views. And what I want you to see is that he's not, we, we don't see this response in either of these scenarios from Jesus or the Colossians or Paul instructing the Colossians in this. We don't see them saying, attack, harm them, hate them. That's not anywhere in here. And unfortunately, when we get in these instances where we're feeling some of that pressure, whether it's from an individual or a kind of a corporate sense, one of our tendencies is to attack, to fight back, to shame them, to try to regain power in that relationship. And in the end, we end up hurting them, we end up hurting ourselves, and what I think is the worst thing is we end up hurting the testimony of Jesus. How many things, uh, it was months ago now, but um, Matt talked about that, uh, how Christians are responsible for so much injustice. This is why, because people have used these divisions as an excuse to attack and hate and uh, lord over people in unhealthy ways. We also don't see him saying, retreat or isolate. This is probably my go-to tendency. I, uh, I'd like to think of myself as more assertive than I am probably, but when things get tough or when I feel conflict come my way, I just want to run, or I just want to hide. And he's not saying that either. He's saying for both, we see the example of Jesus pushing back in against this, not against them, but into that conflict. And we hear Paul instructing the Colossians to lean into that conflict. Uh, and here's the thing is that it's, it's just quite easier to avoid and ignore it. This is why we have the history of monks in, in Christendom. Monks, some of them went for good seasonal spiritual reasons. Like, I'm going to spend three months, kind of out of the example of Jesus, who went uh, 40 days of just spiritual retreat. But what we actually see, and I visited some in Greece, these crazy tall pillars that you have to be like a professional rock climber to get up. They would hide up on top of those and build their uh, monasteries on top so they could uh, filter themselves from everybody around them and just kind of live in that silo, literally a silo. That's not healthy either, but it's a natural impulse in each of us. He's also not saying, uh, he's not saying that we, could, uh, we should cancel them. Let's see where I'm at here. Yeah, losing track of my notes here. Yeah, we're not, he's saying we shouldn't cancel them in our lives either. And this is something that I think all of us are seeing more and more in the culture today. There's a phrase for it, cancel culture. And it's the idea of when I see somebody that disagrees or I hear from enough, you know what? Unfollow. I'm done listening to you. You're gone. You're out of my life. In some extreme situations, you're literally out of my life. I'm going to erase you and your existence from my life. And there's nothing worse that you could do, especially as an agent of God's good news. How is that good news to anybody? That's terrible news. We see God here instructing us both through Colossians and through Jesus' model to engage, not disengage, to have conversation, not cancel people. And I, I saw an article this week uh, posted in Gospel Coalition, and they told this story about Herman Bavink. And you guys may not know who he is, but he was a Dutch theologian from the late seven, uh, 1800s uh, to the early 1920s. And I had to read his, he has four volumes of systematic theologies, and I had to read them all in seminary. They're translated from the Dutch, and they would stack about this tall, and they were not light reading. It was one of the hardest assignments I had. Great mind, great dude, but they shared the story about how when he lived 
uh, in the Netherlands, he became really good friends with this guy uh, called Christian Snauk at Leiden University, which was the elite university. This guy came from an elite family, but kind of uh, clouded in uh, scandal. And then Bob Inc. came from kind of a humble family. And this guy was really progressive with his views, and Bob Inc. was very conservative with his views. They couldn't be more opposite, but it shared instance after instance how they fought to maintain that friendship and how Herman Bob Inc. actually shared about how it, uh, it, it helped his views and uh, his theology develop. The reason I had four volumes of books to read, because he had a friend like Christian that could actually challenge his thinking and help him to think it through clearly. And ultimately, they went different paths. They stayed friends, but that guy actually ended up converting and becoming a Muslim. Like, they couldn't have been more different, but they maintained their friendship to the point that Herman Bavink was, because again, this guy's family was ensnared in uh, scandal, he would get negative grades because of his name, and Herman Bavink would get these great grades and refuse to uh, take his graduate, take his diploma until they uh, reappropriated his grade. That's what kind of a friend he was, and he couldn't be more different. I love that example of a former Christian leader. Uh, the French president, uh, you may have seen this uh, article circulate, and a lot of the local stations picked it up, but is calling out and condemning uh, cancel culture right now, saying, you can't do that, and it doesn't help anybody. And he has this quote, it says, our, our culture is that we should talk even if we strongly disagree. He's seeing the trajectory of what he sees intertwining woke culture and cancel culture into this toxic thing that everybody just shuts off everybody. We cannot cancel and ignore people. We have to engage each other, engage in conversation. So what does it mean for us? Obviously, we can't attack or retreat or cancel others. Instead, as Paul says here, we have to be wise towards others, make the most of opportunities, speak with grace and salt. And the way that Jesus modeled this was he asked questions, then he built trust. He entered into story and used story to illustrate uh, kind of a neutral, meaning-making way of understanding that person's life, and he asked more questions. This is a great model as we uh, think about how do we engage people well. So how many of us in here, like Jesus' situation, maybe has somebody in our life that we're feeling, or people even, that pressure from? How many of us have reacted in the wrong ways that we've talked about right now over those? And how could we actually embrace conversation? How can we move into, quite frankly, a place of discomfort and actually have the right conversations to grow, hopefully ourselves, but in the perfect world? And this is Paul's heart in the Colossians, is so that they can see Jesus through it despite your differences. Maybe you uh, identify more with the Colossians where you're feeling kind of in a place where you, you need some care right now and you're feeling a little bit of that pressure. What should you do? Should you hide? No. He's saying go out and have conversations. Go out and build relationship with even the people that oppose you. What you get in this is two sides of the same coin. One is care seeker. One is care giver. But what's interesting is the, the answer for both of these is to converge with conversation, to jump into conversation with these people. Enter into their story, ask them questions, uh, build trust, allow them to process and create meaning. This is why we did that search series a while back. We tried to create a space where people could safely ask these questions and engage this because we want this to be a place of uh, where they can trust that we're not going to attack them, where they can have meaning. We want you to build that in your relationships. This is why we're so intentional about engaging other people. We want you to build those relationships. Some of these tough conversations, it's hard to do right here because they don't know me to know my heart behind what I'm saying. But if you're having those conversations after a lot of trust is built, you can have real conversations that moves and changes both you and them.